good evening. Thank you for joining me tonight. Um, I decided it was about time that I talked a little bit about me on Elisa Live and a little bit about what we do. Um, we'll follow the usual format. So if you've got any questions, please pop them in the comments below and I'll try and answer them at the end if I can sort out the comments and all the technology streaming. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> um, so I worked as a nurse in the NHS for over 20 years. I worked my way up to senior sister in the emergency department and emergency nurse practitioner. I then transitioned to the community and I worked as a health visitor. Um, I've seen the direct impact firsthand um, that people's homes have on the quality of their lives. I've always loved property. Um, I did the buy, refurbish, refinance model on our own homes without really realising that's what we were doing and not realising it was a strategy. Um, we moved to Devon about three years ago and I struggled to get um, senior nursing work part time around my slightly more complicated childcare <laughs> requirements um, down here. So I decided to um, investigate property and I formed Pebble Properties. Um, I did a lot of learning, reading books, listening to podcasts, and we ended up buying a couple of flats on one freehold. We refurbished them, stripped them out completely, refinanced them and pulled all our money out. And then we're all ready to go again. Um, then I had a chance encounter with someone who opened my eyes to developing supported living properties for adults with learning disabilities and complex um, needs. And this really clicked and resonated with me and I was hooked. I have two lads. My younger son is severely visually impaired. I've been a school governor. I've been a trustee of the Chartered Eye Cancer Trust for the past seven years. I'm also a trustee of a small local charity. My husband, Andy, has complex PTSD as a result of his army service and his paramedic service. So this all means that I've accessed organisations from many, many different angles. That as a charity trustee, a school governor, an acute nurse, a community nurse, parent of a disabled child, wife of, disabled, wife of a disabled veteran, an advocate for others. And I think this helps me navigate the systems and bureaucracies in supported living that many other people find frustrating. Um, it is still frustrating. I set up the Supported Living Facebook group as I'd found loads of frustrations when we developed our first supported living property. And I found there was no reliable information source that I could turn to as a property investor where I could look for help. If you're looking at a HMO model or a serviced accommodation model, there's loads of Facebook groups and advice and courses you can do. And I found very limited for the supported living that I was looking at doing with complex needs. Um, so that's why I decided to set the group up. I've been thrilled with how it's grown and I've been thrilled with the community that we're building. So thank you all for being part of that. Since setting it up, I've had conversations with loads and loads of people, and that's been a great thing about it, connecting with so many people. But a lot of people who um, have properties and a lot of people who are looking for properties. And it seems that there's a need for a gateway to bring the two together so they can connect. And that's something I'm working on at the moment. And there'll be more information about that coming out in the next few weeks. I do use the term tenant rather than customer, even though the word tenant has feudal roots and isn't terribly in vogue at the moment. I think it's really important for the client, for the tenants that I'm working with. Some of these individuals have been called patient, client, service user. And I think that the term tenant focuses on their relationship with the landlord and not on their health or emotional needs. To me, supported living is about giving people safe, supported homes which allow them as much independence as possible supported living is a hugely diverse sector accommodating people with a wide range of health and all support needs and it's not easy to generalize the best schemes are the ones that are personalized to the needs of the people who'll be living there but there are some common themes and some common questions that I'm asked a lot since I've set the group up. So I wanted to address a couple of those here. And one of them is how to get started as a property investor in supported living. 
I think the first thing you have to look at is, is there local demand? Is there support from a local organisation? There's no point unless there's actual demand in the area that you're investing in. And what is needed? For example, an area I work with down in the southwest has currently has no long term accommodation provision for adults with learning disabilities. The nearest is a two hour drive away. That's if you have a car. If you have to go by bus, obviously, it takes a lot longer. So and obviously that's not good enough for families who want to stay close by. The organisations I'm working with have got exciting plans to grow that provision and we're looking forward to helping them with that. Um, something you need to do is talk to people. You need to talk to care staff, social workers, occupational therapists, volunteers in the area, your friends, your friends of friends who may be working in any of these fields. Anything that you're interested in, you need to try and find and talk to people who are actually working in that and find out what the need is and what from a property perspective, what don't they have at the moment? Um, when I interviewed Amy Vahl a couple of weeks ago, she suggested volunteering with local charities and attending homeless forums as ways to find out that out and get involved in what's happening. Basically, you have to put yourself out there. You have to get talking to everyone and it doesn't happen quickly. It can take time for people to get to know you and to trust you. Another question I'm asked loads is what properties are actually wanted? And this again depends on the tenant group that you're working with, your end user. Um, if you're looking at learning disabilities, autism, mental health, there's a move away from the HMO model and towards individual self-contained units. If this is to be a home for life, then compatibility issues will still occur as they do in any HMO and careful matching is required to make a home safe and a comfortable place for them to live. Multi-unit blocks of self-contained flats with a carer's flat or some communal space are often really desired and this is a model that we're working on developing in a couple of areas um, at the moment. Obviously the larger the block the more lucrative it is for the property investor um, but there's rarely an appetite for going above nine or ten flats in one building. Um, in fact, there's some CQC guidance around keeping the numbers lower than that even um, that's just coming out. The move away from old fashioned institutional care means that people are focused on making accommodation, accommodation for learning disabled and mental health, especially part of the community. And so smaller numbers fit this better. For some transition models, like short term accommodation for care leavers, they may want HMOs or for emergency accommodation, they may be happier with larger numbers in one place. Um, and so there's different models that fit different places. It depends, as I said before, if this is to be a home for life or a transition home while someone is supported, given short term intervention to help them live more independently. Normally parking is a requirement. Outside space is often wanted that can be communal outside space um, and near transport links. We found that when you're looking at location, there's a sweet spot um, for when we're particularly looking for our learning disabled residents, tenants, we're looking to find that sweet spot between a really affluent, peaceful area where the neighbours sadly may hate a cat, may mount a hate campaign. And I know that has happened in several areas to rough areas where it may be unsafe for people to go out. It also needs to be near local facilities and amenities so people can walk to a shop, they can get on a bus, they can go somewhere for coffee or to meet friends. If you are doing an HMO, there may be a need for some extra communal space. Maybe don't add that ensuite to the downstairs reception room because that room might be needed as a breakout space or as a sensory room. Level properties are really desirable. There's a huge shortage of accessible property for those with mobility issues. That's in private rental as well. Um, and detached properties are really, really required, especially detached bungalows. So how to develop your property? People can be really simplistic and say, you just need to do this, but one size doesn't fit all in supported living. The refurb needs to be safe and with good fire standards, that's really important. 
because of the range of tenants that could be living in these properties, obviously the needs are going to be very different. If you're setting up emergency accommodation for homeless transition, then a simple basic refurb might be required. However, if you're working with tenants who have more complex needs, then more highly adapted properties might be needed. If this is a long term home for someone with complex needs, then it could be a highly individualised refurb. Ideally, you want to work with your local care team or housing association to make sure your property is adapted to suit the needs of your clients. As Russ Krubsey said, getting these groups involved early in your refurb, well, refurb or build can save a lot of time, grief and money when I interviewed Russ a couple of weeks ago. Um, you can also access grants sometimes when you're developing properties in supported living. There's the Disabled Facilities Grant, which is paid directly to a builder and can be used if you're doing a refurbishment for a named individual. Capital grants are also available. They're not easy to access and they have to be applied for by a registered provider of housing. Also, charitable grants are available. Local charities and trusts may support with setup costs, um, but these are harder for a property investor to apply for. They, they might be easier for a charity you're working with to apply for. Um, I was, want to talk a bit about a refurbishment that we did of a property. I'm just going to go to screen share. Hopefully you can see that. This was a bespoke bungalow development that we did for um, a home for a young man with complex health needs, with really complex needs. Um, we were approached to develop this specifically for this young man. Um, it, this was originally a two bed probate property with an integrated garage. You can see where the door is at the front. That was a garage space. Um, it was very dated and very tired. This young man had been inappropriately housed for several years and was being evicted from his home by his landlord. There was a real concern from the council to get him appropriately housed. He has complex learning disabilities and has 24 hour care, sometimes two carers. We worked with the whole care team. We attended meetings to plan the refurb in detail. Everyone from commissioner level down to his key worker was involved in making sure we got this right. Getting everyone on board with our plans for the building was essential from our solicitors to the building control and meant everyone understood the importance of housing this young man. We worked with the builders who were used to doing these kind of adaptations and who have a high level of empathy and understanding as well as a lot of patience and ingenuity, both of which are needed at times. The legals took forever and we ended up having to rush the refurb to get him in on time. As I've mentioned, he was being evicted. These are poor quality photos, I'm afraid, because we were so busy. Um, but my brilliant build team worked round the clock and we managed to get him housed. In all the planning, we made sure that everything we did could easily be reversed so that if this was no longer needed by the tenant, it could easily be converted to a family home for sale or for rental. We were able to access £30,000 of disabled facilities grant money as this was an adaptation for a named individual. But this, this was paid for the specialist fittings and you'll see there were quite extensive special fittings required. Um, and it was paid directly to the builder for the works once completed so that money doesn't come to you it goes directly to the builder let's show you some other stuff so we did a complete strip out of the property as i said it was really dated so you can see the before and after photos that everybody loves there um, just to give you so this is a, throughout the property we had to fit flush light fittings led flush light fittings um, to reduce ligature risk um, easy level Easy to clean, level, uniform flooring throughout. The floor had to be the same throughout the whole property. Um, the curtains are attached by a Velcro fastening. They look like normal curtains, but if they're to be pulled, they're not going to do any damage. They just come off. We had to fit strong internal doors throughout and privacy film on all the front windows. Where's my kit? I've gone there. Um, in the kitchen, 
again a before and after photo we had to make sure the the kitchen cabinets were as flush and robust as possible that was for everything that was in the kitchen we widened the access to ensure easy safety through and it was a through kitchen so um, there's a hidden cooker override safety switch and we tried to make it a bit more contemporary and suitable for a young man to live in Um, we converted a really dated old tired bathroom and made it into a wet room. Again, this had to be as flush as possible. Um, and we tried really hard to avoid an institutional feel whilst maintaining his safety. This wasn't easy at all um, because the flooring that was needed and specified by the care team is like a hospital flooring, but it was green. So we put green grout in the tiles, which you can't really see there, but it does look quite funky. And we um, there was a specialist toilet required that had this integrated toilet seat and the one that was specified was metal and looked just like a prison toilet and we managed to find a, a white one so um, it, it was all about trying to avoid that institutional feel and make it feel more like a home um, flush fittings and a sensor tap we had to replace all the windows with strengthened glass windows throughout um, just to allow that extra level of security and prevent damage. Um, we created a carer's suite, so we converted that integrated garage into a carer's room with, the, with individual access for the carer to be able to come and go without necessarily having to invade the tenant's privacy. But there is also access through from the carer's suite into the main, the main rest of the building. Um, this had uh, their own toilet and basin, a space for sleeping in, a small office area, and a secure door with a lock, so it's a safe place to retreat to. We created a sensory room. Um, we, create, we painted two walls in the building, this green, so it creates a green screen, which is, um, they use a projection app for calming and for sensory time, and um, so just literally painting it green, the right shade of green um, in two rooms allowed for that. And as you can see, the very minimal fittings and furniture. The radiator covers um, were a tail. <laughs> we were told that um, the radiators needed covering. They were um, a trigger point and potential for anxiety to be focused on. And he had in the past pulled lots of radiators off the wall. So um, our builder went ahead and ordered the radiator covers you can see on the left with the linear stripes. And um, when they arrived, you can see actually they're, they're not quite flimsy and not robust enough. Um, so a bit of an emergency meeting with everyone on site and our brilliant builder and joiner managed to come up with actually just creating their own bespoke radiator covers, thick solid MDF with drilled holes throughout the front to allow the heat out, not large enough to get a finger in. And once painted, were completely smooth. So there was no access, no ability to grab or shake or, or dislodge this radiator cover at all. Um, they managed to do that. This all happened within 48 hours before he moved in. So we had joiners literally working round the clock, making radiator covers for every single radiator in the building, but they managed it and they were brilliant. Um, so that's again it from the outside um the difficulties we had with this property were that we got the, the surveyor down valued it um we lost the appeal even though we had really good local comparables and this is where the challenge of financing your supported living properties really comes to the fore because this young man was classed as a vulnerable tenant so we had limited financing products that we could go to and the other options all use the same surveying panel so we were stuck with that valuation we basically had to accept that down valuation which was really frustrating um, this means that we've left more money in the deal than we've planned um, but we do get um, 1300 pounds a month rent when the market rent for that area would probably be around 900 we have a hands-off investment that's all set up. We don't, there's nothing that we have to do. Um, and on a five-year lease, and we probably have a tenant for life. The local council used this property as an example of collaborative working, and we're really thrilled with it. A real highlight for me was meeting his mum and her crying with happiness, saying she never thought a son would have somewhere like that to live. That was just brilliant. Um, 
and the other great thing was that when the, when the tenant moved in, he's, he's not good with change and transition and the care team expected him to be anxious and unsettled for quite a while. But we heard he'd settled really quickly um, and he's reported to be happy in his new home. So that was absolutely brilliant to hear those things. I'm going to stop the share now and I'll have a look and see if there's any questions um, in the group. So let me have a look and see if we've got anything. lots of comments so thank you everybody um hi how do you find homeless charities to work with i think as so i mentioned that really looking at homeless forums um volunteering and i think um you know listening to amy's and lee's talks that i've done will probably give you some guidance there really um sharon these individuals oh yeah okay um what about implementing of safeguarding that's doesn't fall under our jurisdiction that comes under the care team and the register providers for thing we provide the accommodation we make it safe and that's then down to them um thank you mark um I'm finding it difficult to find an RSL in Worcestershire any help of how to find one. Basically, the ways I said, it's not easy. There isn't a magic cure of how to do that. Um, was this good practice shared with the local authority? It was the local authority who were really pleased with it, Sharon. So they were the ones who were talking about it. Um, yeah. So it was it was it was a really inspiring good thing to to be involved in. I love being part of that team. It sort of used my nurse brain and my property brain, and I um I love the the way they combine in doing these properties. Um, if you've got any more questions, drop them in the comments, and I'll try and come back to them later. But thanks ever so much for watching.